Hey everyone, welcome to another science news segment. Uh, today I have some uh, science news stories for you. They're, they're mostly about human impact on the biological world. So our first story involves uh, the international smuggling of reptiles, published by the AP News here. Border authorities find 52 reptiles hidden in man's clothing. 52 reptiles, that's a ton of animals. You can see in uh, some of the pictures here. Um, uh, okay, this is, this is a picture from February 2022, uh, provided by Customs and Border Protection. It shows, quote, snakes in bags found hidden under and in a man's clothes by CPP officers at the San Ysidro, California, port of entry. Um, okay, so this is just uh, part of the article. Um, and then here are, uh, this is an undated photo that shows some horned lizards that were found uh, during the same smuggling attempt. Okay, let's get to the article. San Diego. A man who tried to slither past U.S. border agents, uh, they got to work that pun in there, uh, had 52 lizards and snakes hidden in his clothing, authorities said Tuesday. How do you even fit that many in you? Wouldn't you look ridiculous, like, trying to steal, like, a bunch of sweatshirts and stuff from the from the store? Like, you're all going to be, like, bulging out with all lumps and stuff? How can you hide that? The man was driving a truck when he arrived at the San Ysidro border crossing with Mexico on February 25th and was pulled out for additional inspection, U.S. Customs and Border Protection said in a statement. They found 52 live reptiles tied up in small bags, concealed in the man's jacket, pants pockets, and groin area. Nine snakes, 43 horned lizards were seized. Some of the species are considered endangered. You know, there's so many angles to this that are just super messed up. When you take animals and you, tra you, you smuggle them, you transport them across borders into habitats where they're not supposed to be, you risk creating invasive species. This can be super dangerous for the local ecology, super destructive. Uh, Hawaii, for example, doesn't have snakes, and they work really hard to make sure that they don't have any snakes. But if somebody were to s smuggle snakes onto the island, they would almost certainly become an invasive species. There's a ton of ground nesting birds, uh, not to mention like domestic uh, animals like cats and dogs that snakes would uh, utterly ravage and they would be able to spread and be super invasive. It'd be, it, it would be extremely destructive. And so Hawaii, for example, tries really hard to keep snakes off the island. This smuggling story, even though this was in California, you know, across the Mexico US border, um, it's still, Super awful. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see the same ecological destruction of invasive snakes move from, you know, Mexico to Southern California as you would in Hawaii. But still, this is a serious problem. Uh, it can harm the local ecology. And if some of these species are endangered, here's another angle to this. If these animals are endangered, you uh, endanger those individuals by bringing them to a new habitat where they, they don't know the layout of the land. They don't know the predators or the prey. Maybe what they eat isn't there and, and they, don't know how to, they don't know how to live in this new habitat. That's always possible. And so they're basically just being killed, like thrown out into you know, some remote wilderness. Well, if that's what you're doing... You're not really helping the endangered status of these animals. You know, you're, you're making it worse. You're driving them closer to extinction. That's why smuggling and stuff like this is terrible. You, smugglers don't care about animal welfare. They don't care about um, the extinction of these animals uh, any more than they care about, um, you know, proper animal handling, animal care, making sure the animals are happy. That doesn't matter. These people are just trying to make money by smuggling these animals. They don't care about the ecological consequences, the ethical consequences, none of that matters. Uh, okay, so they quote Customs and Border Protection Director of Field Operations in San Diego, Sidney Aki, uh, Aki, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name, quote, smugglers will try every possible way to try and get their product, or in this case, live reptiles across the border. In this occasion, the smuggler attempted to deceive CBP officers in order to bring these animals into the U.S. without taking care for the health and safety of the animals, unquote. So the man, a 30-year-old citizen, U.S. citizen, was arrested. So stupid, man. So stupid. Why would you do something like this? All right, well, let's go to our next story. Our next story involves, uh, and, and if you live somewhere where it snows a lot, where it gets icy in the winter, you'll definitely understand what I'm talking about here. 
Okay, so published in Salon, there's a, a brief article. Road salt runoff is making freshwater lakes inhospitable. America's freshwater lakes and therefore many regional water supplies, ooh, are at risk from de-icing chemicals. So here we see a, uh, a tractor laying down salt to break up ice on the road. For, you know, road safety, of course. There's a, a, a benevolent purpose here. Um, okay. So uh, before we get to the article, let me just explain a little bit. In areas where it gets cold and it freezes every winter, um, there are several strategies that people use to deal with the ice. Sometimes you'll have a grater combined, just break it up. Sometimes it's too hard for that. Uh, so you need to use like, a chemical method like laying down salt. Um, the salt helps to melt the ice. It clears up roadways and walkways. It makes them safer to traverse for pedestrians and cars alike. Uh, you know, and this is fine. It works great for that purpose. Um, the benefit is obvious. And the same is true for other strategies, like adding nutrient-rich fertilizers to crop fields. You know, for example, that's another example of uh, humans altering the environment for our own benefit. Uh, and using uh, another example is using salt compounds to help um, extract metals and minerals from mines. You know, that's another uh, case use uh, where uh, human intervention alters the environment uh, and it benefits us. It does. The, the short-term benefit is obvious. But if you step back, and you look at the larger ecological consequences of these actions, it's not great. These road salts, these mining chemicals, these agricultural products, whatever, whatever example you want to look at, they all wash out in the rain into streams and rivers and lakes, and they alter the pH and the osmolarity and the oxygen content of the water. So you'll have microbial communities that are disrupted first. And, uh, you know, this, this might lead to algal blooms or mass die-offs. And whatever happens, that has its own chain of dire consequences. Mass algal blooms, for example, are often caused by fertilizer runoff. Uh, the algal blooms consume all the oxygen in the water, and this creates an anoxic dead zone. And that could lead to the widespread death of larger marine life, like fish. Salts that are used to de-ice roads also get washed away in the rain, and they get washed into bodies of water. Now, many nations have guidelines or regulations for water quality uh, in an attempt to mitigate this issue. This is a known issue. So the question is, do these mitigation guidelines, do these regulations work? Are they strong enough? Are they scientifically grounded? Uh, are freshwater, uh, and I guess this is, this is most important, are freshwater ecologies actually protected by these regulations? Okay, so uh, this article explores a new study that was published. Uh, it describes a new study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, that study sought to address that question. Um, let's go into the article first, and then we'll, we'll dig into the abstract of the study. So here in the article, road salt runoff is making freshwater lakes inhospitable. As yet another storm descends on the United States, local governments prepare to dig their citizens out by applying de-icing salts to asphalt and sidewalks. Yet the resulting salt pollution in freshwater ecosystems may prove to be a far more difficult hole to dig ourselves out of, as de-icing chemicals have become the status quo for creating upwards of an 80% reduction in rates of traffic accidents. So there you go. Here's a use, here's a benefit for us, but wait, there's a larger ecological problem. For those of us living in colder climates, we begrudgingly accept certain oddities of winter. The rasp of snowplows in the early hours of the morning, and a thick layer of brine over everything. For the sake of safer roads. Some municipalities, such as those in New York State, apply an average of 23 tons of salt for every mile of each lane of traffic. Oh my god. That's an immense quantity. Like, I didn't know it was that much, but... For every mile of each lane of traffic uses 23 tons of salt. I don't know if you've seen like how the salt is stored. Uh, I used to work in road construction, and usually when um, when you're using road salts uh, as a chemical in your road construction, it's to like harden some kind of you know material, some kind of uh, plaster that you know you mix with water or something like that. Um, you use a ton of salt, and it comes in these uh, half ton or one ton bags that you have to move around with like forklifts and you know heavy equipment and stuff like that. Um, Twenty three tons of it for every mile of every lane. I don't want to hang up on this, but that is boggling my mind right now. 
Continuing the article, while we rarely question the wisdom of such precautions, consequences linger out of sight as de-icing salts seep into aquifers and wash into waterways. Man, uh, when stuff pollutes aquifers, that freaks me out because aquifers are so important, but a lot of people don't know anything about them. A lot of people haven't even heard of aquifers, but uh, that's where a lot of our fresh water comes from. Um, that's where a lot of our uh, water sources go. And so if we pollute our water, we can inadvertently pollute our aquifers and that pollutes our drinking water. And that's really, really dangerous and really terrible. Along with agricultural fertilizers, mining operations, and climate change, de-icing salts contribute to a, <clears throat> a growing salinity problem in freshwater lakes. New research, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which we're going to get into that paper in just a second, determined that government regulations that set thresholds on ionized chloride from human pollutants, chloride ions are a part of salt, so if we use salt to like break up ice on roadways, Part of that's going to be sodium, part of that's going to be uh, chloride, uh, NaCl is the chemical, uh, chemical formula. Um, and so they're looking at ionized chloride uh, levels in these freshwater lakes. Uh, quote, that's at thresholds on ionized chloride from human pollutants that fail to sufficiently protect critical freshwater zooplankton species. In the absence of these microscopic grazing organisms, algae proliferate and starve the whole ecosystem of oxygen, and the whole food chain falls apart. Okay, so they quote Dr. Bill Hintz, uh, who I believe is an author on the study. Uh, yep, there he is, William D. Hintz. Uh, quote, It's becoming increasingly clear that we need to develop new chloride thresholds, new water quality guidelines that really do protect our freshwater ecosystems from changes due to elevated salinity. Hintz emphasized the urgency for governments to reassess thresholds for what are considered permissible concentrations of chloride in freshwater lakes. The desalination process is really expensive, he added. We can't do it on a massive scale. So once we pollute a lake ecosystem with salt, that salt will stay in concentration pretty much until the lake turns over. Unquote. Okay, so here is a paragraph describing um, uh, the study. Dr. Hintz, another scientist from the University of Toledo, collaborated with Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, to lead an international study to determine the impacts of salinity on zooplankton across North America and Europe. Previous research has focused on lab settings, but this study is unique both in its approach and scope. From 16 different sites, the team extracted what Dr. Hintz called semi-natural communities, communities of zooplankton. Their goal was to assess thresholds for chloride ions, in relation to variability in the specific geology, water chemistry, land use, and species composition of the sites. Okay, so before we go into that, let's uh, let's dig into the uh, the study itself, so we can actually see what they did, what they studied, what they found, and uh, the rest of the article should make a bit more sense. Okay, so in uh, PNAS, current water quality guidelines across North America and Europe do not protect lakes from salinization. Oh, that is not good. Okay, so significance. Okay, so this is basically restating what we've explained already, um, that uh, using these salts can have ecological consequences. They can harm freshwater uh, biomes, species in these biomes, such as uh, important zooplankton taxa, the loss of which leads to increased phytoplankton biomass at many study sites. Um, we conclude that current water quality guidelines, and that can be contaminating, by the way. We conclude that current water quality guidelines established by governments in North America and Europe do not adequately protect lake food webs, indicating an immediate need to establish guidelines where they do not exist and to reassess existing guidelines. So this is an example of where the regulations aren't strong enough. The regulations need more teeth. They need to be stronger so that uh, their intended purpose, protecting these freshwater ecosystems, can actually happen because what's the point of having regulations that don't actually achieve what you want them to achieve it's just theater it's almost misdirection like look what we did from uh, from a politician so uh we need studies like this we need science like this to analyze regulations find out if they're working and tweak them make them stronger in certain cases like this to make sure that they're actually doing what we want them to do which in this case would be protecting freshwater lakes okay so abstract of the paper Quote, 
Human-induced salinization caused by the use of road de-icing salts, agricultural practices, mining operations, and climate change is a major threat to the biodiversity and functioning of freshwater ecosystems. Yet, it is unclear if freshwater ecosystems are protected from salinization by current water quality guidelines. Leveraging an experimental network of land-based and in-lake mesocosms across North America and Europe, we tested how salinization, indicated as elevated chloride, or Cl-, uh, the ion symbol, concentration, will affect lake food webs, and if two of the lowest chloride ion thresholds found globally are sufficient to protect these food webs. Our results indicated that salinization will cause substantial zooplankton mortality at the lowest chloride ion thresholds established in Canada, 120 milligrams uh, chlorine ion, <coughs> excuse me, chloride ions per liter, and the United States, 230 milligrams chloride ions per liter, and throughout Europe, where chloride ion thresholds are generally higher. For instance, at 73% of our study sites, chloride, <coughs> chloride ion concentrations that caused a uh, equal to or greater than 50% reduction in cladocerin abundance, those are like the, the zooplankton, like a, a taxa of zooplankton, uh, the cladocerins, uh, in reduction in cladocerin abundance were at or below chloride ion thresholds in Canada, in the United States, and throughout Europe. Similar trends occurred for copepod and rotifer zooplankton. The loss of zooplankton triggered a cascading effect, causing an increase in phytoplankton biomass at 47% of study sites. Wow. At virtually half of the sites that they studied, um, they found that this loss of zooplankton caused by uh, in a massive influx of chloride ions, this loss of zooplankton caused an increase in phytoplankton, like algae, and this is what leads to al uh, algal blooms. Okay, they explain here. Uh, continuing. Such changes in lake food webs could alter nutrient cycling and water clarity and trigger declines in fish production. There you go. So as the algae sucks out the oxygen and contaminates the water with you know d uh, dead algae debris and stuff like that uh, and other uh, metabolic byproducts from their, uh, from their metabolism, from their nutrient cycling, you're going to see this lake environment become really uncomfortable for fish. And fish eggs, fish larvae, you know, fish fry, they're not going to survive as well. Adults are not going to thrive as well. And eventually, it's going to, quote, trigger declines in fish production. They, uh, they finished the abstract saying, quote, Current chloride ion thresholds across North America and Europe clearly do not adequately protect lake food webs. Water quality guidelines should be developed where they do not exist, and there's an urgent need to reassess existing guidelines to protect lake, uh, lake ecosystems from human-induced salinization. So there you go. Pretty intense study. Um, we could look at the, uh, uh, the sources, uh, like the places that they studied, the sample sites, these lake mesocosms across North America and Europe, but uh, I don't have full access to the article, so bummer. Uh, anyway, let's go back to the, the Salon article. Um, they're quoting Dr. Hintz again. Uh, we're seeing such a decline in the abundance of the zooplankton community that these guidelines really aren't protective of these communities. When you lose those zooplankton, those, those zooplankton eat a ton of algae. Uh, at 47% of the sites, we see a greater algal abundance, which would be suppressed if we had the zooplankton feeding on that algae, unquote. Zooplankton are critical food for young fish and smaller species. Though it remains to be seen, fish populations are likely to shrink as multiple trophic levels of the food chain constrict. This is what biologists refer to as the cascade effect, a chain reaction caused by the disruption of one trophic level of the food chain. So another example of this uh, that you might, have, you might be familiar with is removing predators. So if you have predators at the top of your, of your food chain, at the top of your, your food web, Predators perform a down-regulatory uh, uh, behavior where they, they cull the populations of herbivores. So say you have like a herd of elk or bison or something moving through. They're going to feed on the vegetation and they're going to do some damage to the, to the plant life in the area. But you have these predators like wolves or bears, for example, who will hunt these prey animals. Maybe they'll pull off a young one or a sick one or an old one or an injured one, something like that. Uh, but... However they act, however they, they capture their prey, in so doing, 
they downregulate the prey population. Uh, they, they reduce the prey population's numbers. They reduce the overall impact that that prey population has on the vegetable environment, on the, the vegetation, on the plants. This is, you know, basic ecological principles here. And so if you remove the predators, if you take that downregulation away from the ecosystem, then there's, there's nothing constraining the herbivore population. So the, those, big, uh, herds of, those big herds of elk or bison might uh, expand to unsustainable levels. They'll overconsume the vegetation and they'll strip the land of plants. And uh, that, in and of itself, is catastrophic to the environment because you have, you have all these other animals like rabbits, rodents, insects, birds, who depend on the tree canopy, tree seeds, you know, the environment created by roots, the stability in the soil created by roots, all this stuff. But if you remove the predators, the herbivore population expands, they overeat their forest environment or grassland environment or whatever, they destroy the ecosystem, everything else suffers, all those animals move, the, the soil degrades, and you basically create a, a desert wasteland. That's the, the long-term end consequence of deconstructing you know, a land-based food web ecosystem like that by, for example, removing predators. Okay, um, totally rambling on a, on a tangent. Let's get back to the article. In reality, the impact is more like a ripple than a cascade, though. The impact does not just affect one linear chain. While high salinity does not necessarily create, quote, harmful algal blooms, unquote, that are toxic, a reduction of zooplankton undoubtedly could cause an overabundance of algae and other phytoplankton, sometimes going so far as to create inhospitable dead zones that lack oxygen and light. So there you go. If you have all these uh, uh, algae, phytoplankton and stuff, they're consuming oxygen too to engage in um, their own cellular respiration. And their physical mass coating the surface of the water can block light. And so all of a sudden, the lake body that's been uh, uh, over inundated with algae because there's no zooplankton down regulating the algae, all of a sudden this lake environment is very low on oxygen and it's very dark because the algae is crowding out the surface and absorbing all the sunlight. And so for everything living in the lake, the environment suddenly changed drastically. It's much less hospitable. Uh, continue, uh, the article continues quoting uh, uh, Dr. Hintz. I would say this issue is like climate change, he insisted. We need to act now. When you act 10 years, 15, 20, 30, 50 years down the road, Every year that passes by, if you're still using the salts, you're still increasing the concentration. Then, who knows how long it'll take to go away. The science is becoming clear, though. We need to do something about salt pollution. Unquote. So there you go. This whole story is, you know, this is more uh, than an example of human-caused environmental degradation. It's a story about how even when we're trying to do the right thing with regulations and water quality controls, we have to ensure we go far enough. We have to go all the way because half measures like water quality thresholds that don't even protect the life they're intended to protect are obviously not sustainable. This isn't a justifiable, workable solution. But it's really tricky because it's not as easy as just lowering the threshold and forcing everyone to comply overnight. De-icing road salts save lives. They, they prevent accidents. They prevent injuries every year. It's not something that we can just give up cold turkey unless tire traction technology makes huge advances in the next couple of years. Or there's some new de-icing technology that's developed that's uh, as effective or more effective than, than de-icing road salts, but, you know, without the salts. And hopefully without some other new horrible downstream ecological consequence. These are massive technological and logistical challenges. This is a great example of uh, how important, but also how difficult, uh, these problems are to solve. And really, you can add this to a mountainous list of other difficult problems that our civilization needs to solve in order to live sustainably with the Earth and all of the living things on it. But, uh, you know, identifying areas where we're causing harm and uh, understanding what the harm is so that we can you know, stop doing that and find a new solution, understanding where the harm is coming from is the first step. And so, you know, you got to look at the silver lining here. Yes, this is bad. Yes, this is harmful. 
Uh, and yes, it's going to be a difficult problem to solve because until something better comes along, we need de-icing road salt. But, you know, we've got to work with what we have. It's a, it's a, it's a work in progress. All right, everyone. There's one last news story, uh, and this is kind of a, a lighthearted story. This is this is a good one. Um, it's kind of a uh, a counter to a few of the, the the couple of bummer stories that came before. So uh, the article here in Yahoo News: the birds outsmarted us. Magpies worked together to give scientists the slip. So there's a magpie there. Uh, the uh, picture caption: magpies are notoriously territorial but they're also highly intelligent and social birds. Okay, now before we get into the article, uh, which is actually quite brief, um, I want to just dig into this real fast, set some context, you know, you know how I like to do. So some animals are really crazy smart, like, uh, like many primates, many cetaceans, and corvids. Now I want to talk about these corvids for a moment. That's what this article is about, what this study was about. Because uh, this news here is hilarious. Um, now, now, corvids includes mi- include many birds that you're undoubtedly familiar with, like jays and nutcrackers and crows and ravens, among many others. All of these birds, despite their size, are incredibly intelligent. They, uh, they demonstrate a variety of complex behaviors. They can make and use different kinds of tools, uh, and they pass various tests for self-awareness and for, you know, various theories of mind. Uh, uh, On that note, some birds can pass some tests and demonstrate a level of intelligence that surpasses even young human children, like two to three-year-olds. Now, one group within the family Corvidae is uh, is the magpies. Now, this group, uh, which is probably paraphyletic, honestly, it's it's, uh, uh, in, uh, I should say, kind of an older clade that was put together with morphological evidence and not, you know, genetic evidence. And uh, a lot of these clades have ended up being paraphyletic, meaning that when you study the genetics, they're not actually closely related like that. They, uh, they might be somewhat closely related, but they're not, they shouldn't all be in one group. You know, there's, there's other relatives in between them. Uh, but anyway, uh, the magpies, this big, uh, you know, fun tote bag of, uh, bird species, uh, it includes a lineage of whole Arctic Eurasian species and a lineage of South and Southeast Asian uh, species. And these are all well known for their beautiful song singing abilities and for their remarkable intelligence. Now, recently, some researchers were trying to study a species of Australian magpies. Uh, so uh, we can get into the article here because they quote a lot of these scientists and uh, they, they describe what they started to do, what their original intention was and what ended up happening. Okay, Uh, to read this Yahoo News article, anyone who's ever been swooped at by a magpie will be horrified to learn (laughs) that the birds are working together. A A research team in Australia studying a new kind of tracking device for birds was surprised to find that magpies were cooperating to give them the slip. So they quote uh, Dominique Potvin, an animal ecologist at the University of the Sunshine Coast, Uh, in an article for The Conversation, uh, which is probably some periodical or news piece uh, in Australia. Uh, Quote, When we attached tiny backpack-like tracking devices to five Australian magpies for a pilot study, we didn't expect to discover an entirely new social behavior rarely seen in birds. Our goal was to learn more about the movement and social dynamics of these highly intelligent birds and to test these new durable and reusable devices. Instead, the birds outsmarted us. Okay, so now the article provides a bit of description of the birds. Magpies are a staple in Australian bush and backyards. The iconic birds are known for their warbling calls and territorial but playful nature. Most Aussies, especially cyclists and runners, will likely have had some kind of experience with a swooping magpie in their lifetime, as many harrowing but hilarious viral videos have shown. According to Potvin's research paper, after scientists attached tracking devices to five birds, they began to display what seemed to be altruistic behavior. They would cooperate to help each other remove the trackers. One bird, one bird would even snap another bird's harness at the only weak point. They appeared to be helping one another without getting any immediate tangible reward, Potvin noted, demonstrating both cooperation and problem-solving. 
So it's back to the drawing board for the team, which needs to find a more effective way of collecting data about the birds. <laughs> That's really funny. Okay, so interesting little article about the birds. Let's look at the study. Uh, again, uh, I don't have access, uh, I haven't downloaded the PDF of the full study, and we don't need to get into the whole thing now, but uh, the abstract should be a, uh, uh, an entertaining and informative little read to round out our science news segment for today. So, published in the Australian Field Ornithology Journal, Australian magpies, uh, Gymnorina tibison, cooperate to remove tracking devices. Okay, I wonder if I got that scientific name right. Abstract. Recent advances in tracking technology have enabled devices such as global positioning systems, uh, loggers, to be used on a wide variety of birds. Although there are established ethical considerations to these processes, different species may react differently to particular devices and attachments. Thus, pilot studies are still of utmost importance in this field. Here, we describe one such study, trialing a novel harness, des <coughs> trialing a novel harness design for GPS tracking devices on Australian magpies Gymnorina tibison. Okay, so uh, basically what they were trying to do was uh, test out a new harness for a GPS device on these birds. Because these are the practical details that you have to iron out before you can actually engage in, in some more real scientific study. You know, you need to develop your instruments first. You need to make sure your instruments work and that they're uh, properly integrated into your study system, such as these birds. Uh, the authors, they wanted to make sure that the, uh, the harnesses would stay on firmly. They wanted uh, to make sure that they would provide good data, that they had reasonable battery life, that they could handle the uh, environmental conditions, that they had the computer storage space, uh, <clears throat> storage space for uh, all, of, all of the data that was going to be produced. So the question is, what went wrong? Well, uh, continuing with the abstract here. Despite previous testing demonstrating the strength and durability of the harness, devices were removed within minutes to hours of initial fitting. Notably, removal was observed to involve one bird snapping another bird's harness at the only weak point, such that the tracker was released. This behavior demonstrates both cooperation and a moderate level of problem solving, providing potential further evidence of the cognitive abilities of the species. To our knowledge, this is the first study to report the conspecific removal of GPS trackers and should be considered when planning <laughs> and should be considered when planning future tracking studies, especially on highly social species. Unquote. Okay, so uh, this is really fascinating stuff. The birds demonstrated their intelligence by rapidly figuring out a way to escape the harness, and then communicating that information to each other in some capacity, such that within just a few hours, all of the magpies in this little population group were free from the harnesses. Again, this is, this is really fascinating stuff. I love studies that demonstrate this almost freakish intelligence of, uh, of animals outside of the context of the research parameters. So yeah, it's cool when you have you know, intelligence tests, behavioral tests that you use to engage, uh, analyze an animal's cognition. And yeah, the animal can engage that test as you expect them to do so and get results that you can reasonably interpret. But it's also really interesting and really exciting when the animal doesn't want to play your game, when the animal is like, mm, I don't want to do this. Uh, so we're going to take off this harness. I'm going to fly around and you know leave you silly primates on the ground. Really hilarious stuff. All right, everyone. Well, that was a, a few fun uh, science news stories. Hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you thought this was uh, informative and entertaining. And uh, as always, thanks for listening. See you next time.